Okay, I would like okay, to. I would like to order the order the meeting of the Cabarrus County Cabarrus County nurse. Uh, welcome, welcome everyone. everyone. I'm getting I'm, a strong echo coming back at me, which I think now has corrected itself. We're we're getting kind of accustomed to these virtual meetings. Uh, it's good to have everybody with us tonight. You all have you all have the of the agenda, the agenda. Uh, in front of you as well as on the screen and first item is the approval of the work session agenda including work changes on page three changes on page three uh, do i hear a motion so moved second okay we have a motion by commissioner honeycutt and a second by Commissioner Hsu to approve the agenda as presented, including the changes on page three. Is there any discussion? Uh, all in favor, please say aye. Aye. Uh, all opposed, no. That motion passes, and we move now to discussion items. Uh, first up is a market study uh, presentation. And I think that will be Lundy and Becky Droz. And I'll turn it over to you, ladies. Good evening. Good We're going to let Becky just take the presentation and run with it to kind of help with the sound this afternoon. So if you have questions, I'm available as well as Ashley Allen. Thank you. All right, well, since just getting back to the beginning here, I'll go ahead and introduce myself. I am Becky Droz. I am an HR advisor with the Employers Association. Would you please go to the next slide? So the Employers Association is a business association, and we offer HR solutions to kind of help organizations with the people side of their work. Um, we have partnered with Cabarrus County for a couple of years now to evaluate the positions for salary grades and to assess their um, kind of market competitiveness. Um, I am happy to be back and happy that we've been able to uh, get through now all of the departments within the county. So this has been uh, year three of three. So that's been awesome. If you would please go to the next slide. What I'm going to spend just a few minutes talking about is the methodology of the study. Um, some of that should be familiar to you from previous years. And then I'm going to talk about just a couple of recommendations and next steps. Next slide, thank you. Um, this year we did look at nine different departments. This year we wrapped up the county looking at admin, human services, infrastructure and asset management, solid waste, and transportation. Uh, we studied 54 different jobs this year that represented 294 employees across those departments. This year for the data, we looked at the Cabarrus County Sponsored Survey. Uh, with that one, I will show you in just a moment all the different organizations that participated. But that's giving us some really good comparisons. It's giving us local counties and cities and towns around us that have similar roles that they reported their market data for. We also use data from the Employers Association North Carolina Wage and Salary Survey. Uh, with that survey, we we're able to look at a lot of different regions as well as uh, industries and not-for-profits. I also use data from Economic Research Institute, or ERI. Um, that is a huge survey that provides national data that we can break down into a variety of different data cuts to get information that's applicable to the jobs in Cabarrus County. And then very similar, comp analysts also very robust national data that we can kind of slice and dice so that we're looking at um, demographic information that would be similar to the positions you have as well as for who you would be hiring from or who you might be losing in terms of Next slide, please. Perfect, thank you. Um, with the surveys, again, as in the past, we're looking at the position descriptions. So it's not just about title. Titles can be very misleading. Uh, so this year, early on, we engaged with the different department managers and leads to make sure that we understood what all of the different knowledge, skills, abilities, and expectations for the different jobs that we studied were. From there, with those job descriptions, I went into those different surveys that we just looked at. And I pulled data based on the Charlotte metro area. Even though you are in Cabarrus County, is kind of a, an area of where you draw employees from or where you potentially lose employees to, we looked at the Charlotte area on the whole. 
this year for a lot of the positions, we looked at all industries because again, when you think about where you would be hiring from or losing people to, for a lot of the jobs in these different departments, it's not restricted just to government or not for profit. So in those other surveys like the ERI and health analysts, as well as North Carolina Wage and Salary Survey, we went a little bit broader to make sure that we really were getting relevant market data. When I pull market data, I look at the median data point. So I don't use an average when I pull that data. I'm looking at the median just so that I have half, half of people making above and half making below. I prefer the median to an average just because the average can be skewed so easily. So with those different surveys, I pull that median data point and then all four of those surveys are averaged together to create what's called the market average. And next slide, please. This year we had really nice participation in the Cabarrus uh, County sponsored survey. So you can see the different cities and counties that we reached out to and that responded and provided data on similar jobs. And again, that survey was given equal weight to the, to the others in determining the market average. All right, next slide. So as you'll notice, we jump right here to future recommendations. I have to say that the, um, I'll say that the HR team has done a really nice job in, I guess, in kind of watching the data and making sure that the grades are appropriately aligned. This year with the different departments, there are no recommendations to make any job grade changes based on the market data. So in working with the HR department in Lundy and Ashley, I know that the goal is to have the market average kind of be aligned with the midpoint of your salary grade. And what I found this year is that for those jobs across those nine departments, that is happening. So the jobs are appropriately placed within the salary grade. So there's no recommendation to make any changes based on the market data. One of the things that has come up in looking at this data over the past couple of years is the kind of placement of employees in the range. While the jobs may be placed appropriately, I think there is some room for some employees um, to be placed in different areas within the ranges. And it's not something that absolutely has to be done, but it's something to look at and see if it's anything that is causing any potential issues, uh, causing any concerns over equity with compensation. So the recommendation is to spend, you know, maybe the next year looking at compression and then next year go back and continue the process of resuming those benchmark studies. So, you know, based on the past couple of years of checking to make sure that your jobs are, are graded appropriately and now we know that they are, I think there's some kind of other work to be done there. Of course, anytime there's a hot job, anything that the county is losing a lot of people or is having trouble filling, I absolutely encourage Ashley and Lundy um, to reach out and let me know and we can look at those off cycle just to see if there has been a shift in the market for those positions. Lundy, anything to add or any questions from anyone? I, I would just add that we um, initially had this pre presentation slated for April and a few of the items that potentially could have been recommendations have already been um, incorporated into the budget process. So um, if there are any questions about those projects or anything budget related as well, we can answer those. Okay, any questions for Lundy or Becky? Uh, Lundy or either one of you would be fine. Um, when I was reviewing the agenda, this, what I'm going to ask you may not be in this particular topic, but it is the financial topic where we were talking about the merit versus the COLA. Is that part of this, Lundy? That was, um, yes, it was something approved earlier in the budget planning cycle. So it has been placed into the budget in terms of the recommendation. So uh, that was an additional recommendation that Becky had provided, but again, because it seems to already be moving through the budget process, we didn't spend much time on that today. But well, it is included. These, well, I was just thinking that we were trying to do away with the COLA and going strictly with the merit. But it looks like, you know, where I seen something, we're going to do the 1% COLA <clears throat> in addition to the merit. Is that, am I seeing that right? That was a recommendation that I believe came out of the February retreat. We looked at three different possibilities, which included um, everything from just focused on the COLA, just focused on the merit to that hybrid or blend. And my recollection is the board was comfortable moving with that middle ground where we had a much smaller COLA capped at 1%. 
and then we allowed merit to um, grow a little bit to, to provide more um, incentive for our employees to perform at a higher level. Rodney, I know you prepared some slides for the budget. If you want to jump in to maybe assist with that. No, I think you covered it pretty well, Wendy, is the budget does reflect a 1% COLA in an additional expanded merit base. Uh, I think it was seen as sort of a compromised position of moving us more towards an emphasis on performance and less of an emphasis on uh, cost of living adjustments. The other factor in, in keeping the cost of living was that we had some concerns expressed from staff that were on the higher end of the pay scale if we eliminated the COLA. And so this was sort of a compromise that allowed those folks to continue to grow in terms of their salaries. Okay, I got it, guys. Thank you. Okay, any other questions or comments for Lundy or Becky? Okay, well, I thank you very much for that presentation. Uh, as I have said before, I think that this is an extremely effective way for the county to stay on top of uh, our competitiveness and to make sure that folks are compensated fairly. Um, I certainly get a, a great deal of comfort by knowing uh, that, that we've got some really strong factual materials to base these decisions on uh, looking at our competitive uh, counties and cities around us. Uh, so, so I certainly compliment our, our HR department and our administration for engaging in this, this process, uh, which, which helps us keep, keep good people that we've got, which is the, our most valuable asset. So we thank you very much for that. And if there are no other questions, we move now to item 3.2, and that is our innovation report from Debbie Brannon. Welcome, Debbie. Good afternoon. Welcome to uh, the innovation report for June. Uh, last month, our employee digital book club explored how to create gratitude habits to improve our health and relationships with others. This month, we're going to continue the theme of gratitude with sink or swim, a fable about workplace communication and coming together in a crisis. There's no doubt that we are going through a crisis in our workplace and stressful no matter if you're working from home or in the office. This fable gives us insight into how expressing authentic appreciation can help change everything and help us survive storms that threaten us in work and life. I look forward to discovering which animal I most rep, uh, resemble in this fable. Am I most like the ambitious yet naive sheepdog or maybe the wise old puffin? Listen to this audio book with me and see if you sink or swim. Today's innovation report is on innovative resources developed to help vet veterans in our community get the resources they need to be healthy, safe, and thrive. Last April, the county manager and I met with the Veterans Department to discuss the county's new innovation initiative. These innovation ideas were given to us by Veterans Service Officer Lori Henson and the Veterans Service Director Tony Miller. Lori had just attended a conference where she heard about new VA benefits intake tools allowing electronic signatures and claim submission. This led to the development of an electronic benefit claims system to replace a paper intensive process. Tony requested the ability for veterans to check in for appointments using an office lobby kiosk. Necessity is the mother of invention, they say, or in this case, it sped up the development process. While this project was on our list to do, it was not a priority until we began discussing COVID-19 phase three reopening of offices. The self check-in ability gained priority and turned into an app that allows veterans to check in with the office from their phones and wait in their car until notified by the service officer that they are ready to see them. Lighthouse is an application programming interface platform or an API provided by the US Department of Veteran Affairs that provides developers secure API access to VA data for building helpful tools 
and services for veterans. The Bears County is one of the first local governments in the nation to use this API for VA benefits, electronic submission and tracking. According to the VA, we are the second local government to implement this API and only a few large software vendors <clears throat> have successfully integrated this system, this with their systems using the API. I have to give props to the first local government, Washington County, Wisconsin. The paper benefit claim submission process requires st stacks of paper to be faxed to the VA, scanned into LaserFish for archival purposes, then shredded. Getting the facts to connect to the VA and complete successfully often requires multiple attempts, frustrating staff, and extending the time it takes to get a veteran approval for benefits. Veteran Services was the first Cabarrus County Department to use laser, LaserFish for doc, document archival, and they have been using LaserFish for almost 20 years. This application developed using LaserFish workflow allows veterans service officers to submit claims to the VA electronically and automatically files the documents in LaserFish. If a veteran is not already in the system, the service officer selects add veteran and completes nine fields to add the veteran in the system. Next, staff can be, begin attaching claims related documents to the veteran's file. When all forms are completed, signed and attached, the veteran service officer submits the packet to the VA. Our application assigns a unique ID to the packet, submits the packet to the VA through their secure API, then uses LaserFish import agent to store the packet documents in the county's LaserFish repository, automatically organizing according to the document type and veteran. The veteran service officer uses the veterans application dashboard to monitor submission status at the VA. The dashboard provides quick access to review active cases, complete cases, and remediate cases with errors. We use LaserFish workflow and the VA API integration to check the claims packet status at the VA every two hours between the working hours of 8 a.m. and 6 p.m. Monday through Friday. If there is an error or the status of the packet moves to fully processed, an email notification is sent to the veterans officer with an updated status. The new electronic benefits claim submission saves staff time, reduces paper consumption, provides insight into a vet's application status at the VA, and expedites the approval of benefits for our veterans. The first successful electronic submission was processed over the Memorial um, holiday weekend with an approval status in three days an incredible improvement compared to the paper process of one to two weeks. The second innovation project tonight is uh, still in beta. Tony's request for a lobby check-in kiosk was expanded into an online queue app for COVID-19 social distancing. Due to a very small waiting area and the high-risk clientele of the Veterans Office, a check-in get-in-line app was developed for our Veteran Services Department. This progressive web app allows veterans to check in from their phones and wait in line in the car. When the staff is ready to see the veteran, a notification is sent to the veteran's phone. We plan to extend this application to integrate scheduling and team video meetings to provide customers access to government services from their own devices and from any location. Through, media, through video meetings with government employees. The Q for Vets is a device agnostic progressive web app. All you need is a link to the app on a phone, tablet, or desktop. Type in your information and select put me in line. You'll receive a notification, notification that you are in line. If you need to get out of line, simply hit cancel and then confirm. 
When a veteran service officer is ready for the next client, they simply click on check in to send a message to, to the veteran's phone. If the veteran has requested a phone call, a message pops up for the service officer with the number to call. Service officers also have the ability to add someone back in line if needed. When it's the, your turn, you are next. Veteran Services will see you now is displayed on the veteran's phone. To meet Tony's original request, we have also added a back office screen to add veterans to the wait queue for an in-office check-in system. Today, we submitted our 2020 Digital County Survey to the Center of Digital Government and the National Association of Counties. It was an extreme honor for Cabarrus County to place first in 2019. To complete the 2020 survey, I had the opportunity to review all the county's digital accomplishments this year. Our 2020 achievements are even more amazing than 2019's, and I can't wait to see what we rank this year. I'm so thankful for the collaborative work for, of staff from every department. It is your work that makes county, our county, a leader in innovation. Uh, thank you, and I'm going to see uh, if Tony has any comments he would like to add on, on the uh, innovation we're working on for his department. All right, again, good, good evening, everyone. <clears throat> First and foremost, I'd like to say thank you for Debbie, Todd, and ITS and their crew. They've been very awesome with helping us with this program. And as Debbie mentioned, it will tremendously cut off with help with time. Traditionally, if we submit a claim, we send it to an intake center. They go through their process and it could take up to 10 days before they even get it into the system. They will utilize that same date that is the document shows, but it may take up to 10 days or so forth to hit the system. With the system that we'll be using through Debbie and them, uh, like she said, I think within three days it showed up and Sometimes, I guess, when it gets up and running good, it could show up the same day. So that means they can start processing that veteran's claim right away, and it's already in their queue to start working. So that will be quite tremendous, and obviously it's going to cut back on paperwork, time, and it gives us the ability to continue to help uh, veterans at a faster pace. In, in reference to being able to check in when veterans get to the office with the pandemic going on, and again, us having such a small space, uh, we've come up with a format that we can only have about four veterans in the lobby at the same time, two separate families. Uh, we'll utilize our front door for individuals to come in, and depending on their health and medical conditions, they'll go out our back door that leads into the hallway, and they can walk right back around to their cars for those that are healthy enough to be able to do that. And then being able to sit in their cars, you know, that way they have the comfort of their own vehicle and then the safety of being able to wait in line to be seen. And this format is sort of like if we've all been to a restaurant, sometimes they give us a little machine that lets us know when they're ready or they'll give you your phone number and contact you. So it's uh, very creative and it's gonna be very helpful and add to our customer service for veteran services. Anybody got any questions as far as how we might handle this or anything in addition that I've added? Any questions for Tony or Debbie? Well, thank you very much for that presentation. I can certainly see how that could be a tremendous asset for, for our veterans, not only during this current crisis, but it sounds like this is something that would be beneficial every day. Um, and I think that's probably one of the, the good things to come out of the situation that, that we're currently in uh, and I've heard Debbie make some comments in the past, and we've we've heard from some of our folks in the court system also about uh, some of the advantages that they've realized by take using technology to do some things uh, during this time uh, that they now say this is probably going to going to become regular business for us, which uh, creates tremendous convenience for our consumers our customers, our citizens, uh, and saves taxpayer money as well. So 
thank thank you all for 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 your positioning Cabarrus County uh, as one of the tops in the nation uh, in taking advantage of some of this technology and and I think that's evident in what you said that we're only the second county to successfully uh, be involved in this process that now takes three days what could have taken two weeks before um, and you know, it was certainly uh, was my privilege to stand with you last year to get that that first place award uh, in that digital county survey um, and so un unfortunately we'll not be gathering this year but I'm anxious to hear what the re results are on that are there any other questions for for Debbie before we move on to our next item thank you again and we will move now to item 3.3 from infrastructure and asset management. We're happy to have Michael Miller with us to give us an update on the governmental center project. Welcome, Michael. Good afternoon. I wanted to give you all a quick update on the governmental center skylight and re-roof project. Um, and I'll start with the project, the progress to date um, all scaffolding has been set up and Ike's Construction decided to do the scaffolding a little differently um, around the commissioner's chambers by using one rolling section of scaffold and moving that to the area where they're working each day rather than setting up scaffold long term all the way around the commissioner's chambers. Uh, this is going to result in cost savings on the scaffold rental and it's been much less intrusive inside the building. Demo of the skylights above the front entrance and the skylights above the back balcony is complete and all debris has been removed. And two openings have been cut into the roof um, for relocation, relocation of the existing smoke purge fans. Uh, new curbing and temporary roofing has been placed in these locations. Currently, we're at somewhat of a standstill. Uh, we're waiting on some rolled structural steel tubing that will support the new roof. This material is being manufactured in Chicago and was supposed to have already been on site. Um, so we expect that to show up any day. Moving forward, the next major step is to begin placement of the new structural steel columns that will hold up the new roof and the framing of the actual roof. Next week, Ike's construction will start framing the roofs over the front and back skylight areas and then decking out those new roofs. During the next two weeks, Ike's will move the smoke purge fans and hopefully begin to erect a structural steel when it arrives. Looking further out, um, during the next month, Ike's will begin to install the new concrete around the interior skylights on the roof. It's actually a concrete curbing and they'll begin to frame up the new roof and so by the end of June, Ike's will start to actually remove the skylights after the new roof is installed and fully dried in. There will be uh, plywood panel panels temporarily in place where the new windows will eventually be installed. Uh, regarding schedule, the project is still on track to be complete with the work on the inside of the building by the end of August. And then a re-roof will start on the rest of the building and should be complete by the end of September. Generally speaking, the, the weather has not had a huge effect on the progress of the project yet, since most of the work's been done inside and most of the work being done is not really the type that would, would be affected by weather. But moving forward, if we don't start to get some consecutive dry days uh, where Ike's can do the concrete work, the project could experience delays and it's also worth noting that today is the start of hurricane season, so hopefully we won't have any of that type of weather. And that is where we're at, so I'd be happy to try to answer any questions you guys have. Question Mike. for Michael. Michael, has Ike's given you any indication of any supply chain issues due to uh, COVID? No, sir. The, the only thing that I'm aware of to date is that structural steel that I mentioned. But I can, I can check with um, Ike's and see if there's any expected delays. Okay, any other questions for Michael? 
We thank you for that update. As I walk around and look at that construction that's going on, uh, I can make very little um, connection to the things that you just described, which gives some indication of my understanding of the project. But uh, I think you did a good job of attempting to make us understand. So thank you. You're welcome. Okay, we move now for discussion items for action. Uh, first up is item 4.1, that is appointments to boards and committees. Uh, you have all received a report of all of those appointments and the recommendations. Um, and are there any questions or comments on that at this point? Okay, hearing none, we will move to item 4.2. Um, this is a business incubator grant opportunity. We're happy to have Ellie Landrum and Paige Casterdale uh, both with us to talk about that item. Good evening, everyone. Um, let me just clarify by saying this grant is rapidly evolving. And so what you see in the agenda um, has actually changed um, today, as of today, the EDC will actually be the primary applicant for this grant request. Um, so they are asking that the county um, act as a co-applicant as we are the government entity and the EDC is the nonprofit. Um, I, the Flywheel Foundation will also be a co-applicant. So rather than um, asking for a $10,000 match, the EDC is just asking that the county um, be a co-applicant and bless <laughs> the grant application. Okay, I guess my question would be what you said the flywheel what? Hey, Commissioner Morris, this is Paige. Good to see you all. Um, I'll give a little bit more um, background on this on this project. We have been working um, in partnership with Flywheel for many, many months. They are a, an organization that um, develops innovation centers. They have two in North Carolina, one in um, Davidson. They operate the hub at Davidson, if you're familiar with that facility there. Um, and then they also operate um, another facility in Winston-Salem, and they have several other projects in, um, in development along um, the I-85 corridor. Um, we have long felt like at, at EDC that there was an opportunity to better serve entrepreneurs in our community, and so we have been working for some time now to develop a strategy around that. And in the last several months, um, we were introduced to Flywheel and felt like their model um, really makes a lot of sense for our community. They essentially come in and convene all of the existing resources that support small businesses and entrepreneurs, but then they also provide their own programming to um, kind of fill in whatever gaps might be there. So we are to the finish line with this project. We have a very strong confidence that they're gonna be signing an LOI on a, on a property in downtown Concord um, in the coming weeks. Um, and then if everything goes according to plan, um, they'll actually be opening their doors in October or November. So what we had been doing um, in the last month or two was identifying um, funding sources to underwrite the programming that would take place there. Um, and we had been exploring grants, um, the Cannon Foundation being one and, and then other, uh, other organizations throughout the state. Um, when this particular opportunity was put in front of us through the EDA, we felt like it made a lot of sense. Um, if you look at the, um, the notice of funding opportunity, they specifically outline a business incubator as a way to facilitate um, business development in a post-COVID economy. Um, and we, you know, we're several steps down that path already. So we were, we were able to um, pull together what we needed to pretty quickly to um, apply for this grant. And so, like Ellie said, at this point, because we're a nonprofit, um, the EDA is asking that we would have a governmental entity as a co-applicant. Um, the Flywheel Foundation is also a nonprofit. And so between um, what Flywheel has committed to the project and then what EDC is also committing to the project, uh, we will be able to cover the financial mat match that would be required for the grant, um, but it just um, makes the application more competitive to have Cabarrus County as a co-applicant as well. 
And so that's what we're that's what we're requesting. Very good. Th thank you for that additional information. Uh, commissioners, do, do any of you have questions for Ellie or Paige on this item? It sounds like that we're just asking to, to participate and bless the project. Is that correct? Yes, yes that's correct. I don't have well, any well, questions about it. I think it sounds like an exciting opportunity and I would like to see that come here. I'm just curious if you have any information on the other two uh, that you could send us just to review. Absolutely. I'd be happy to, to follow up with that. And this was, I'll be honest, we had hoped to be able to um, present this with a nice pretty bow just to let you know what was happening in the community because we are, we're pretty excited about it as well. But um, like Ellie mentioned, things are rapidly evolving and we've been told that we need to get our application in pretty soon um, in order to remain competitive because this is a, this is a popular one. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, thank you, Paige and Sorry. Ellie. Yes, go ahead. Um, is this something we need to act on tonight or is this something that can wait until the regular meeting in two weeks? So I'll be honest, I'm not sure um, that it would be nice to have it within the next two weeks before the next meeting, to be honest, because we were told to by the EDA rep, if we could get it in this week, um, that would help our chances a lot. But I also, you know, respect the process. So we can get it in after the 15th if that's necessary. I don't have an issue with going ahead and taking it up. I was going to say, Mr. Chairman, I would make a motion that we amend our agenda so that we can take action on this tonight. Okay, we have a motion on the floor to uh, amend our agenda and to um, um, uh, suspend our rules to take action on this tonight. Do I hear a second? Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second to suspend the rules to take action on this item tonight. Uh, is there any discussion? Uh, all in favor, please say aye. Aye. Okay. All opposed, please say no. That motion passes. And at this time, I would entertain a motion. Uh, I guess that this would not be to approve the match as was previously requested, uh, but to uh, apply for the grant. Is that sufficient, Paige? Yes, to be a co-applicant on the grant, yes. Great. Thank you. Second. Okay, we have a motion by Commissioner Honeycutt, a second by Commissioner Poole. Uh, is there any discussion? Okay, hearing none, all in favor, please say aye. 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 All opposed, please say no. Uh, and that motion passes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You're very welcome. Um, I'm doing something, something a little bit differently tonight. Um, uh, in the background, I have a, a television where I can see what folks on channel 22 are seeing as, as we proceed through our meeting tonight. So I would ask everyone, if you would, to please, when you're presenting, to turn your camera on um, rather than seeing a lot of boxes with initials uh, on, on the screen. Uh, so now we will move to item 4.3 from the county manager, and this will be the presentation of the proposed fiscal year 21 Cabarrus County budget and scheduling of a public hearing. I'll turn the floor over to county manager Mike Downs at this time. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I will read the, the annual budget message, uh, and then uh, our deputy county manager Rodney Harris will take you through a slide presentation of the highlights of the budget and then we will be able to answer any questions that you may have. So I'll take off with the letter. It is my honor and privilege to submit the fiscal year 2021 or FY21 recommended budget. Staff has prepared this budget in accordance with the laws of North Carolina and guided by the Board of Commissioners' renewed mission, vision, and goals. We propose this budget amid the COVID-19 pandemic. 
an event unlike any of the last 100 years. COVID-19 has hurt the county's major revenues, and these especially in the property and sales tax areas. Ugh. We project sales tax to drop 17%, uh, approximately 17% from 20, FY20 to FY21. The January 2020 valuation showed an increase in, an increase in commercial and residential property values. However, the projected lower collection rates and fewer new car purchases will mean new prop will mean property taxes will fall short of predictions. At the same time, there is a growing demand for county services, particularly in human services and public health. Our response to COVID-19 illustrates the value of investment in preparation, training, and technology. Public safety employees provided life-saving care while keeping themselves safe. Partnerships led to expedited response to public health, safety, and supply chain needs. Businesses, business processes continued without interruption, keeping industry moving. Employees found new ways to serve our most vulnerable populations at a critical time of need. Quality of life services kept our community engaged in activities that support mental and physical health. This proves that we are a resilient community. And we have done, as we have done many times in the past, Cabarrus will move forward through strategic planning and investment. The FY21 budget will keep the property tax or propose to keep the property tax at a rate of 74 cents and will we'll focus on new funding for schools and educators, quality of life services, support for the county's 1,300 team members, essential building projects or capital projects. The proposed general operating budget totals $276 million, including the following new investments. Schools and educators. Educa increased educator pay supplement. Includes, a fund, includes funds for a 0.5% increase in county paid supplements to educators employed by the Cabarrus County and Kannapolis City School Districts. With this year's increase to the county paid portion, the proposed FY21 pay supplement for Cabarrus County Schools will be 10%. That also includes a 0.5% increase from the Cabarrus County School, School District. And Kannapolis City Schools will be 7%. Because the state pays teachers consistently across the state, these local supplements help attract and retain our teachers. Open and operate new schools includes funding to open and operate Hickory Ridge Elementary and West Cabarrus High School beginning in August 2020. The county will also fund a school resource officer at Hickory Ridge Elementary and a nurse at each of the two schools. Maintain school operations includes funds to maintain operations, which would be local positions, locally paid positions, teacher supplements, and building upkeep and maintenance for Cabarrus County Schools, Kannapolis City Schools, and the Rowan Cabarrus Community College. This represents a 2% increase in funding from last year. Quality of life services, the new courthouse, includes funds and positions to operate a new courthouse starting in January 2023. To maintain the security and safety in the larger facility, the new courthouse will require additional positions, including 22 deputies and three sergeants to secure the building, seven custodians to keep the building clean, to main, two maintenance mechanics to keep building systems operating efficiently throughout the winter and summer months, a technical specialist to support the technology systems that will be installed in the system or in the building. The county will fill these positions as needed and apply balance of funds to one-time capital projects in FY21 and 22. Cabarrus Health Alliance includes funds to increase school nurse benefits and hours, provide an additional 1% match for employee retirement change two school nurse positions from part-time to full-time and fund school nurses for Hickory Ridge Elementary and West Cabarrus High School. Extending the hours at the Midland branch of the library includes funds for a new full-time library assistant. This will allow the branch to remain open an hour later in the evenings 
and an additional operational day each week. And that is projected to be Wednesday each week. The Salvation Army Center of Hope. This budget includes a one-time payment to assist with building a new homeless shelter that serves the families and children. This will be a joint effort with the Salvation Army and the other uh, municipal uh, jurisdictions uh, contributions as well. Support Cabarrus County team members. Appropriate pay. This budget includes funds to pay staff at levels that match similar positions across the state. Also funds a 1% cost of living adjustment and the ability to earn up to a 4% increase for performance throughout that fiscal year. New support includes funds for 42 positions to meet service demands. These positions will remain vacant until the county reviews first quarter revenues and confirms the positions are sustainable with existing and future revenues. Positions that include the county manager's office, there's four positions, a ch chief internal auditor to oversee policies and positions or procedures, a deputy county attorney to provide legal support and guidance and to support our, our current county attorney as, as activity has increased over the years, but then also learn, learn the position for future uh, needs. Early Childhood Education Coordinator to develop and lead the county's <laughs> early childhood initiative. And that is an initiative that the board has, uh, has embraced and directed staff to, to assist in moving forward. A risk and safety manager to conduct safety trainings and oversee federal programs related to our employees and their personal and, and occupational health. Department of Human Services, 10 positions, one part-time and two full-time case manager positions to provide treatment and recovery services to jail inmates. The, current, the county currently offers these services through a contract with Daymark's, uh, Daymark Recovery Services. The county will reassign, reassign contract funds to the in-house positions. Community social work, community social services technician to transport children and supervise visits. In the last year, the number of children in foster care has increased from 100 to over 150. Foreign language interpreter to help the county meet legal requirements and facilitate the needs of a growing Hispanic population. Income maintenance caseworker two to process applications and make updates for adult Medicaid. Through audits, the county has learned about cl client eligibility issues that could have led to overpayments, and this position will help to address those, those issues. Program specialists to support payment requests for workforce and crisis unit activities. Social work program manager to oversee and encourage collaboration between adult protective services and guardianship and the in-home and community support units. Social work supervisor to help address the high turnover rate in child welfare through intense training and oversight. The first 18 months employees are assigned to the division. Social worker three to ease current adult protective services and guardianship caseloads. In 2012, the adult services caseload work group recommended a guardianship caseload of 22 or lower. Case, current caseloads exceed that recommend standard, recommended standard and thus the recommendation for the new position. Emergency medical services, 12 positions, four master paramedics and four paramedics to staff an ambulance at the new joint fire and EMS station built in partnership with the city of Concord. The ambulance will help maintain a response time of under eight minutes throughout the county and throughout this uh, particular uh, response district four relief supervisors to provide additional support and supervision. Industry standard is three to seven ambulances per supervisor. Currently, the county has, has 13 ambulances per supervisor on the day shift and 10 per supervisor on the night shift. Finance, one position, accounting supervisor to oversee and assign oversee staff and assign duties. Human resources an HR generalist to assist with human resources. As I stated earlier, that we have 1,300 team members uh, and with a very small staff and, and the, the workload has become very difficult to, to stay on top of. 
information technology, three positions, analyst programmer to provide GIS support. As we've talked many times this year, our GIS program is expanding. We're discovering and implementing new uh, processes and programs using GIS data. Business systems analyst to support the county's financial and HR systems. A senior analyst or programmer to address backlog of projects that improve the efficiency of county operations. Infrastructure and asset management. One position, a grounds maintenance crew chief to assist with the supervision of the staffs and suppliers and suppliers for projects across the county facilities. Libraries, two positions, a senior library assistant to float between five library branches. In the past, the library system has needed additional coverage at every branch due to staff absences, vacancies, and large crowds. A library assistant to support extended hours at the Midland branch, as I previously mentioned. Planning and development, two positions, two code enforcement officers to perform state mandated construction uh, inspections. And these, these will be handled as we have done in the past, as the quantity or the demand increases throughout the year, we will, we will propose to uh, bring additional uh, enforcement officers on uh, staff. These positions are typically paid 100% by the, the permitting fees uh, for that particular department. And they will not be brought on until that demand and demand comes on. This will facilitate us to, to act to, to put them in place rather quickly. The Sheriff's Office, six positions, two deputies funded by the town of Harrisburg to provide the town with law enforcement services, a business manager within their department to coordinate the human resources and business operation processes between the Sheriff's Office and the county. Two night shift lieutenants to provide greater supervision and reduce the span of control that issues that currently exist. An AV technician to manage the body worn camera program. Essential building projects, community investment fund. We've talked about that throughout the year of establishing that fund. And this is the, the, the first step in making that uh, come to reality. It includes a $40 million payment from the general fund to the capital improvement fund for current and future debt and one-time capital projects. This is shifting that uh, the money from current expense into that capital investment fund. Capital projects include uh, the EMS headquarters, uh, the proposed EMS headquarters includes 2.5 million in FY21 for the design and 14 million in FY22 for construction. Franklin's Park updates includes $1.6 million in FY21 to replace water and sewer lines throughout the park, playground equipment, miniature golf course updates, restroom, snack bar, and offices. Another $4 million in FY22 will replace the boathouse and build a new boardwalk, bridge, and splash pad. Future library expansion includes $10 million in FY22 to address capacity and service delivery at our libraries. The project requires additional funds for operations and staffing. Again, this $10 million would just be for the capital uh, side of the project. A new high school includes 4.5 million in FY22 to design the next new high school for Cabarrus County Schools and $70 million in FY22 or 24 for construction. Our Brown McAllister Elementary replacement includes $450,000 in FY21 for site development and $30 million in FY22 for construction of the new school. The West Cabarrus Library and Senior Center includes $2.5 million in FY21 to design a shared building and $25 million in FY24 to build or purchase a building. The project requires additional funds for operation and staffing. Again, these numbers here are for capital only and additional funds and staffing will be needed. I want to thank the board for your steady leadership during this unprecedented time. Your support allowed us to provide uninterrupted service during the pandemic. Our visionary staff went the extra mile to implement new technologies, revise service models, 
and modify our facilities. These actions kept our employees, their families, and the community safe. I'd like to recognize Rodney Harris, Lauren Tiara, Jonathan Marshall, Susan Farrington, Yesenia Pinata, and many other department leaders for their work to develop a budget that responds to the needs of our community. I'd also like to thank our entire workforce for their commitment throughout this year, uh, enhancing their programs and their service to the Cabarrus County residents. Respectfully submitted, Michael K. Downs, County Manager. And I'll turn it over now. To, if you have any questions now, or we can turn it over to Rodney. He will go into more detail. We've got several slides detailing uh, some of the um, projects and some of the staffing that, that we just introduced through the letter. Thanks. Thank you, Sir. I'll let Rodney go ahead and, and, and come back to questions following his presentation. Can you see those slides? Yes, sir. All right. So the manager has obviously covered a lot of ground and traditionally we would be doing this presentation uh, tomorrow at our first uh, workshop, but we decided because of the number of significant changes in this budget that it made sense to go ahead and do this presentation tonight to give you about 24 hours to digest this information so that hopefully the first hour tomorrow you're prepared with any questions that you may have. So in terms of where we're going to go over the next few minutes, we're going to walk through the recommended budget in terms of the drivers that impacted how this budget was put together. Uh, second, we're going to go through the details on the revenues and the expenses that make up the recommended budget. The third item we'll discuss is the proposed capital improvement plan, which covers the next five years. And then we'll conclude with, with a discussion of the next steps in the budgetary process. So in terms of key drivers, the biggest driver is the population growth that we have experienced over the last several years. And so the county is in the midst of significant population growth that is expected to continue for the next 20 to 30 years. Between 2011 and 2020, our population grew by over 20%. This growth presents an enormous challenge to adequately fund county services and the school systems we support, while also addressing the many capital needs we are faced with, all while maintaining a reasonable and sustainable tax rate. Even during this period of rapid growth, Cabarrus County government has operated in a lean and efficient manner. As you can see from this chart, the number of county employees per 1,000 residents has been relatively stable for the past 10 years. County positions have not grown at the same pace as our county. The recommended budget includes investments in new positions to decrease workloads for current employees and to improve service delivery in the years ahead. This, the, slides are, the slides aren't moving forward, Rodney. <coughs> Are they moving? Yes. Yes, sir. All right. We've got to love technology. Uh, let's see. So in terms of new facilities, uh, they are another obviously key driver for our budget. 
In August, as the manager has mentioned, Cabarrus County Schools will open West Cabarrus High School and Hickory Ridge Elementary. Uh, Cabarrus County Schools are also in the middle of planning for the construction of a new middle school, which should open in August of 2022. At the same time, the county is in the early stages of replacing the existing courthouse with an expanded facility. And the county is also need, in need of a library, expansion of existing libraries, a new EMS headquarters, and a Northeast area park. Each of these projects and others we will discuss later require some level of additional funding for operations. Another important driver of this budget is the creation of the Community Investment Fund or the CIF, as the manager mentioned in his message. The county has historically budgeted debt service within the general fund. For FY21, a sub fund has been created within the general fund to provide a dedicated, sustainable source of funding for capital needs. This change provides far greater capacity to meet future capital needs. There will be three primary uses of the CIF. First, it'll be used for payment of current and future debt service. Second, it'll be used for the payment of PAYGO or non-debt funded projects through transfers out to capital project funds. And third, it'll be used to generate fund balance that will build capacity for future projects. Overall, the CIF results in an additional 100 million of capital capacity over the next four years, as opposed to our status quo. Finally, it goes without saying that COVID-19 has had a huge impact on how this budget was developed. In April, the unemployment rate for the U.S. approached 15%, and the state of North Carolina was just over 12%. These represent the highest levels of unemployment in 10 years. You will note the impacts of COVID-19 in a few places within the recommended budget. Sales tax revenue has been decreased. The property tax collection rate was lowered to recession levels, resulting in lower property tax revenue. The budget holds the majority of new investments until later in the fiscal year, until we are certain no shortfalls exist. One place you will not see an impact is in the use of fund balance or rainy day funds. This is a testament to the strong financial management and a reflection of the board's fiscal discipline that we're not having to use those fund balance. So with those considerations at the forefront, staff spent the last six months identifying the revenues that would be available for FY21. At the outset, it is important to emphasize that we continue our tradition of budgeting revenues conservatively. That approach should prevent the need to reduce budgets during the fiscal year. The largest revenue impacts this year resulted from the revaluation of personal property. I'm sorry, of real property. The county completes a revaluation every four years and the values used for the FY21 budget reflect market conditions as of January 1st, 2020. The county experienced significant real property growth over the past four years with values rising by about 17% to $28.1 billion. When a revaluation occurs, the county's budget officer is required by law to calculate and include a revenue neutral tax rate in the budget. While it is required to include the rate in the budget, the board is under no obligation to adopt such a rate. It is important for the public to understand that revenue neutral does not mean A, the county budgets the exact same revenue as the prior year, or B, that an individual property owner will pay the same tax rate as the prior year or the same tax amount as the prior year. What each property owner pays is impacted by both the tax rate and the value of their individual property. So this slide walks you through the calculation of revenue neutral. Um, so we'll start at the top. The first starting point is the FY20 tax levy. And so to get the FY20 levy, we use the current year valuation, which was 24.1 billion, multiplied by the current tax rate of 74 cents per $100 of assessed valuation. If you divide that by 100, it produces an FY20 tax levy of $178.6 million. We can then multiply that amount by 100 and divide by the new FY21 valuation that we previously mentioned, 28.1 billion, to get the initial revenue neutral tax rate of 63.52 cents. The law then includes an adjustment for the average annual growth since the last revaluation. For the county, we have experienced average annual growth of 3.69%. 
That produces a final revenue neutral tax rate of 65.97 cents, which would produce a tax levy of 185.4 million. It is important to note that the tax levy amounts shown here are not adjusted for the collection rate. Uh, so let's walk through a number of the potential impacts of a revenue neutral rate. So I wanna start with the homeowner or a business owner. So for example, the median single family residential property in Cabarrus County is valued at $210,000. At the revenue neutral rate, the average homeowner would pay $1,385 per year. At the current tax rate, 74 cents, the same homeowner would pay $1,554, a difference of $169 per year or about $15 per month. Again, it is important to keep in mind that actual impacts would vary based on individual taxpayer situations. For the county, a revenue neutral rate would result in significant budget cuts, including the elimination of vacant and filled positions. Sales tax revenue would also be impacted by our tax rate. It is our current expectation each municipality will maintain their current tax rates. If they do so, and we lower our rate, the county would lose approximately 3.5% of our sales tax revenues to the municipalities each year. We would also have to roll back funding needed to keep programs at existing service levels, including for our education partners, and new investments in our public schools, like increased teacher supplements, as the manager mentioned in his message. Finally, any reduction in revenue would have an impact on our ability to fund capital projects, including new schools. So this slide provides a summary of what a one cent tax rate decrease would look like for the county in FY21. For FY21, the county would lose about $2.7 million of property tax revenue and just under $300,000 of sales tax revenue for each penny the tax rate were reduced. In addition to that short term challenge of balancing a budget at the revenue neutral rate, there are also longer term implications. So as you know, we have a five year outlook that we've used for many years and this slide summarizes a revenue neutral view of the next five years. And so you can see that at that rate, the FY21 deficit would be about $15 million and that would increase in FY24 all the way up to over $21 million. So all of these potential impacts, both to the homeowners, business owners, and the county government were weighed heavily in the recommendation to maintain the existing tax rate of 74 cents. Outside of property tax, sales tax is the county revenue most impacted by COVID-19. The recommended sales tax revenue was 17% less than our FY20 adopted budget. Of the $43 million of sales tax revenue, 27 million is budgeted in the general fund and the remaining 16 million is gonna be in the community investment fund as it is dedicated for school capital. And so these next couple slides summarize the revenues uh, that you're typically used to seeing for the county. And so this first table shows all of our funds and the revenues that are associated with them. So in terms of property tax revenues, you'll see at a rate of 74 cents and a collection rate of 97% for real property and 100% for motor vehicles, uh, our revenues increased by about 16% to just under $211 million. That includes the fire districts. At the same time, our total sales tax declines by 17% to $44 million. Our intergovern intergovernmental revenue increases by 13%, and this is a result of our increasing healthcare costs. And then the final revenue I wanna mention, because this will show up in a number of the budgetary numbers you see for this year, is the creation of the CIF is creating some inflated figures. And so the highlighted row, other financial sources, what you're seeing there in that significant jump is the $40 million contribution from the general fund to the community investment fund. And so that is reflected there as a revenue even though those funds are coming from property tax. And so that double counting, while it's necessary from an accounting perspective, makes the budget appear larger than it truly is. So you'll see on this slide that it shows the change year over year as a 21% increase. 
if you deduct that $40 million contribution from the general fund to the CIF, the real increase year over year is about 8%. And so this slide is just focusing on the general fund and the CIF. And so you'll see here similar results. You'll just see that the revenues do not include our other funds, whether that's the landfill or the arena and events center. And then again, you'll see the highlighted row, which reflects that $40 million contribution from the general fund to the CIF. So once those available revenues were identified, we were able to turn the attention to the building out of the expense side of the budget. And so tonight I wanna cover these four primary categories. First, I'll walk through briefly sort of the existing personnel changes that are reflected in this budget. We'll talk briefly about the courthouse, the new positions, I'll briefly summarize how those break down, and then we'll end with a discussion of the education budget that is within the manager's recommended budget. Each of those add up to what you're going to see as the FY21 recommended budget. So like most years, the recommended budget includes two pay adjustments for eligible employees. First, an annual cost of living adjustment for employees that is typically provided in July. Uh, the COLA is based on rounding down the consumer price index and new this year is we've capped that at a maximum of 1%. The second component is merit pay or an employee can receive up to 4% based on their job performance. That is up from 2.5% in the current year. The final increases are state mandated retirement. So the state ret retirement contributions amount continue to climb. And then also our medical costs have increased significantly. Those total about a $3 million increase in our FY21 recommended budget. As we've talked about earlier, the courthouse is another significant expense. Although it's not expected to open until January of 2023, it is prudent to allocate those resources now until we need them at the time the facility will open. So until it is fully operational, funding will be used to support one-time projects. The, in addition to the personnel that the manager mentioned in his message, the operating expenses add up to about $2 million, and those are for things like utilities, maintenance, and security uh, for the facility. The total costs are expected to be about $4.2 million annually. As we talked about earlier, the, the county is lean and efficient from a staffing perspective, but our population growth has led to increased demand and higher workloads for employees. So the manager provided a summary of the new positions that are included in, in the budget, which includes the 35 additional positions for the courthouse and an additional 42 positions. As you can see from this chart, the FY21 recommended budget adds heavily in the area of public safety and the courthouse with 55 of the 77 positions being in that area or about 71% of the total. At tomorrow's workshop, our EMS director, Jimmy Lentz, our sheriff, Van Shaw, our library director, Emery Ortiz, and our human services director, Karen Calhoun, will speak with you about their specific positions and how those will impact the community. So switching over to our education funding, the county funding for public schools, uh, Cabarrus County Schools, totals nearly $76 million, which is a 6% increase or $4.3 million more than FY20. This includes some of the requested costs related to the opening of West Cabarrus High School and Hickory Ridge Elementary School. It reflects, as the manager said, the half percent additional contribution for the local teacher supplement. Uh, although not appropriated directly to Cabarrus County Schools, the budget also includes funding for two school nurses and a school resource officer. And charter school funding is reflected in these numbers. Uh, in addition to the numbers reflected here, the budget also includes the capital outlay of just over a million dollars and other CIP projects that we'll discuss later. For Kannapolis City Schools, the total recommended budget is about $9.3 million, which is a 4% increase over FY20. Again, they have a half percent increase to their local supplement, a multi-tier system support interventionist position, and then charter school funding is also included here. 
And again, they also have a capital outlay budget of $100,000 and then other CIP projects we'll discuss later. And then lastly, we'll talk about Rowan Cabarrus Community College is their total appropriation recommended is 3.8 million, which is a 7% increase over FY20. And those additional expenses are primarily related to the Advanced Technology Center uh, and then other utility increases. Similar to Kannapolis City Schools, they also have a capital outlay budget of $100,000, and then they have CIP projects that are also recommended. So this table summarizes the FY21 recommended expense budget across all funds. And so again, you'll see that same $361.6 million budget. Uh, the general fund represents $276 million of that total. And that is only reflecting a 0.18% increase because of the creation of the community investment fund, which we'll discuss on the next slide. And so this again breaks it down by general fund only, and that includes the community investment fund. And so what you'll see here is that the operations budget for the county, including personnel and operating, is increasing by about 7%. Operating funds for our education partners are increasing combined by about 6%. And then you can also see here how the $59 million budget for the community investment fund is broken out. There's a $41.5 million that will go towards debt service for education, $9 million that will go towards county debt service. There are $3.3 million of transfers to capital projects funds. And so these are funds that will be used for one-time projects. And then the last line, the $5.4 million, is the beginning of building capacity and fund balance for future projects. And so that is restricted money that will stay in the community investment fund that will fund future projects. So again, if you remove the contribution to the CIF amount of $40 million, rather than a 22% increase year over year, it's really a 7% increase uh, in terms of the total county budget. And so as we have done for a number of years, we obviously looked at this with the long-term implications in mind. And so as you can see from this table, at the current tax rate of 74 cents, the county can produce a balanced budget over the next five years or pretty close to it without significant reductions or cuts. This puts us on solid footing for the tax rate and level of service to be sustainable. As part of developing the recommended budget, we also considered the long-term impact of other tax rates. And so I wanted to share a couple of those with you. A one cent decrease could produce a balanced budget in FY21 and FY22. However, significant shortfalls would be expected in FY23 and FY24. Similarly, a two cent decrease would not produce a balanced budget in FY21, and the projected shortfalls would grow greater with each passing year. And so again, that was the rationale for keeping the tax rate at 74 cents. So I know we've covered a lot of ground, uh, but I'm, gonna, I'm close to the finish. The, the last section is dealing with the capital improvement plan and the project investments that are recommended in the FY21 budget. So the first set of projects for FY21 are primarily funded through excess fund balance. As you know, excess fund balance above 15% transfers historically to our capital projects funds, and we're able to utilize those funds for one-time projects. These allow the county to complete projects without the use of debt. And so on the general government side, this includes the beginning of the design work for the new EMS headquarters and the West Cabarrus Library and Senior Center, as well as ADA renovations at Frank Lisk Park that include a renovated mini golf amenity. Funding is also included for an HVAC replacement at our human services facility and to continue renovations at the training and firing range for the sheriff's office. The total investment for county facilities is $10.3 million. For Cabarrus County Schools, funding is included to address their highest priority facility and maintenance projects. This includes initial funding for a replacement ele elementary school in downtown Concord, mobile units, fire alarm replacements at two high schools, and mobile renovations at JM Robinson. These projects total $1.2 million. 
For Kannapolis City Schools, funding is included to make ADA and drainage improvements and to replace the roof at A.L. Brown High School. These projects total $418,000. And finally, the Roan Cabarrus Community College funding is included to replace the Building 2000 roof, HVAC units at the CBTC, and the boiler at South Campus. And these projects total $705,000. So while we would love to pay for all of our projects with cash, we also know that given the volume of our needs, that's not possible. So to that end, we have proposed about $76 million of debt for FY22. For Cabarrus County Schools, this includes the construction funding for a replacement of R. Brown McAllister, design funds for a new high school, and a new mobile unit for the early college. For the county, this includes funds to construct the EMS headquarters, funds to expand a library facility or facilities to address overcrowding, and then upgraded amenities at Franklis Park, such as a new boathouse and a splash pad. In FY24, we have planned about 95 million of debt, which the majority of that is the new high school. And so that $70 million figure is the proposed amount to construct that high school. The remaining 25 million is for the either the construction or the purchase of the West Cabarrus Library and Senior Center. So in terms of next steps, tomorrow at 4 p.m. we will hold the first of our two budget workshops. We will start with a high level discussion, including additional information on any personnel requests and answers to any initial questions you have. That discussion will be followed by presentations from Kannapolis City Schools, Cabarrus County Schools, and Rowan Cabarrus Community College. Following the education presentations, the Health Alliance will present on their budget request, and then we'll wrap up with a general discussion. At the second workshop on Thursday, June 4th at 4 p.m., we will begin with presentations from the EDC and the CDB, and then we'll follow that with a discussion of the fire districts. And then we'll end with a general discussion that gives staff the direction needed to prepare the budget ordinance for adoption. The public hearing will be held during the Monday, June 15th meeting that begins at 6.30 p.m. And the board will be asked to adopt the FY21 budget at the conclusion of that public hearing. So that concludes this uh, presentation. And again, the hope was that by providing this information tonight, it gives you some time uh, because it is a lot of information, a lot of moving parts to sort of digest that so that tomorrow when we kick things off, we can have a discussion and answer any questions that you may have. Thank you, Rodney. Um, obviously, we're going to have a lot more discussion about this at our subsequent two meetings later in the week. Uh, but if anyone has any questions that would like to address either to Rodney or to the county manager, uh, you may certainly feel free to do so. Commissioner Honeycutt, I think you had your hand. So, Rodney, will you be sending us a copy of this today for us to review your presentation? The slides. I will certainly do that. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, you'll okay. you'll and get the we'll, elect you'll get the electronic copy tonight, the PDF form, and then you'll get the hard copy delivered to you in the morning. And that's of the complete budget you're talking about. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Uh, I was talking about his slides just now, but okay. then also I have a question. Um, can you go to the one where it had the school nurses and the resource officer on it? Probably should have interrupted you, but I didn't want to. I'm just, uh, I've got a question about a number. And I was taking notes, so I might have missed something. Now you're challenging me to get the technology to work a second time. <laughs> well, I can just ask the question. Um, the, the, on the resource officer, I'm not sure if I, I, think I know what that. you're going to ask. Yeah, yeah I said it's like $126,000 or something like that for a resource officer. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, so that that is not just the the salary. So that is first year cost for the equipment that the officer, the deputy will need. And so the bulk of that, about half of that, is the vehicle the radio, et cetera. So that's a one-time purchase. Well, I figured that there was something to that, but I just thought I would ask to be sure. Yeah. 
that'd be a great thing to be able to pay them that, but <laughs> that would be nice. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Are there other questions? Uh, for the benefit of the public, um, and I'm, will those budget workshops be uh, televised tomorrow night and Thursday night? Yes, sir. Both of them are be virtual, just like we're doing right now. Exactly. Okay. Well, that that will give the the public uh, the benefit of of listening in on those conversations, and then of course when this comes up at our meeting on June fifteenth. Uh, there will be a public hearing as well. Um, the assumption is um, that that will probably still be a virtual uh, meeting, uh, although we don't. Uh, well, that is the 15th, so that that is prior to the next um, release of, of any uh, uh, adjustments as to the recovery plan. Uh, so we we will have a number of different opportunities for the for the public to participate in that process. I think as was has been true of our regular meetings uh, previously, you have the option to come to the governmental center um, and uh, make that presentation in per in person. That would be included in this video presentation. Uh, there is also an email option. Uh, where you can email in any questions or comments uh, to be read during the meeting. Uh, then we also have the option of someone calling in live during the meeting uh, to participate in those public hearings as well. Uh, and then in addition to that, uh, with some of the regulations by the state, uh, there is an additional 24 hours following our meeting uh, that that comments can also be presented. Uh, and certainly between now and then, um, there, there's always the opportunity for, for the copies of that budget will be made available uh, on our web page and other electronic methods. Um, uh, and certainly anyone can call and ask questions if they want. So there, there are many opportunities uh, for public participation uh, in this budget process. Did I, did I miss anything, um, uh, Rodney or Mike? Um, yes, sir. There, there are two, there are also, I'm not sure about the enrollment is, uh, on the, um, ninth and the 11th, there is a government 101 on the public on the, uh, county budget. So that's two opportunities to, to participate in a review of the budget, uh, talk to staff, uh, as well. So those, uh, you would need to contact our communications department, Ms. Kasha Thompson, uh, and see, uh, I'm not sure if the enrollment is full, but I know they are typically, uh, popular classes. So those are available, uh, next Tuesday and Thursday from 1230 to two. Right. Thank you. Thank you for mentioning that. And I would certainly highly recommend those. I've participated in those classes, uh, over the past several years. Uh, and have found that that folks really uh, benefit greatly from them and having that opportunity uh, to do that. So, so we would encourage anyone to uh, participate that 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 may. Does anyone else have any questions or comments uh, regarding the budget before we move on to the next item? Quick question for either Mike or Rodney. So will Rodney's slides and or Mike's full bore presentation be posted at the website uh, sometime tonight, tomorrow? I mean, just yeah, for, for, for public consumption? Yes, sir. The recommended budget document will be published uh, following this meeting and each of you will receive your uh, official electronic version uh, Lauren will send that to you, including the slide deck, and then tomorrow you'll get a hard copy, but it will be published to the county's website this evening. Okay, great. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I have uh, just a clarification question about the um, uh, budget 101 that Kasha usually does. Is that going to be virtually? Will that be held at the multipurpose room? They are being held virtually. Uh, so they'll be June 9th and at 1230 and it'll be a digital format this year. 
Okay, how how will the uh, public that normally come to those at the multi-purpose room, how will they know about it? Will that be on the county website? Yeah, they put it out on the county website and it's uh, registration is available through the county's website. Okay, well that's what I wanted it for primarily was for the viewing audience so they would know how to, uh, to attend the meeting if they wanted to virtually. Okay, any other questions or comments? Well, certainly thank, thank you to, to all the staff. Uh, that was a lot of information. Of course, you know, we've talked about this beginning actually um, first of the year. Uh, there have been many, many changes that none of us would have foreseen uh, at that time. So that has required a lot of additional work uh, for staff, a lot of additional just adjustments. Uh, there are still a lot of things that 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 we don't know for sure. Um, it's like like we all frequently say, uh, you know, we've polished our crystal ball uh, as much as possible to look into the. future, but there are some things, particularly in this current environment, that are very difficult to predict. I appreciate uh, the explanations that that we that that both Mike and Rodney gave us tonight in regards to uh, some of the and for lack of a better word, contingency plans uh, that are included in our budget. Uh, the fact that some of those expenditures will not be actually incurred until later in the year uh, when we have a better feel for what we're actually experiencing. Uh, so I think that is very, very prudent uh, on our part and I certainly appreciate that being included as part of the process um, as, as we continue to, to, to go into the unknown more today than ever before. Uh, but if there are no more comments or questions, uh, we will move now to item 4.4, .4, uh, and we are happy to have Jonathan Marshall to talk with us about a stormwater easement request at the new, um, or at Odell Elementary School. This is a request from a private development that's being proposed south of the new Odell Elementary School. Um, it's a little bit unique. It's first of all, it's a very small easement that they need for the stormwater. It's less than a tenth of an acre. Um, it is for them to handle the water coming off of our school site, piping it into the storm drainage system that they'll be constructing as part of that development. So for that reason, it's not one we would recommend that you ask for them to pay for this easement because they're handling water that is right now surface flowing off our site piping in and adding it to a larger system. And the Board of Education is also considering this request. Um, right now, this is on your consent agenda. Should they not approve it for some reason, then we would put it on your new business and discuss that, but I don't foresee that in discussions with their staff. Okay, thank you. Any questions for Jonathan on this project? All right, sir, thank you. We will move now to item 4.5. Uh, we're happy to have Anthony Hodges to talk about the HCC BG funding plan uh, from Department of Human Services. Good afternoon, commissioners, and thank you all for uh, allowing me some time this afternoon. Uh, what I bring for you today is our, our funding plan for fiscal year 21 for the Home and Community Care Block Grant uh, money that we receive. Uh, as you know and you are aware, that money comes uh, through the Older Americans Act money through the federal uh, government, and then there's state money added, and then there's a 10% 10, 10 match required by the county. Uh, and then each county uh, has some uh, 
leeway to decide how that money is spent and which programs that's spent on. Uh, Cabarrus County uh, currently has 10 different programs that we have that money divided uh, among. Uh, and uh, the advisory committee each year uh, can make recommendations on how how that's divided and how that's spent. Uh, this year, you know, the state normally will, is supposed to come out with the, the funding, the amounts for the new year in the April timeframe. Uh, as y'all probably remember, a lot of years they don't that money that they don't come out with those figures yet. So we we and they didn't this year. So we don't have the exact numbers for FY21 yet. So the funding plan that I've presented to you is based on FY20 numbers. Uh, and the the advisory committee uh, voted to basically leave everything the same as far as how it's divided between the programs. Uh, what will happen and that right now we're, we're basing that it on it's 880 a little bit over eight hundred eighty three thousand dollars that we would receive and then with the 10 percent match that'd be a little bit over nine hundred eighty one thousand dollars what what will happen if, if you approve this is is we'll submit this and then once the state gives us their final numbers which a lot of times will be in the next you know two or three months i'll come back before you again with that final funding plan with the final numbers to get approval for that. Uh, the the advisory committee has uh, given me permission. If that change is less than a 5% change, either positive or negative, I'll just divide that money between the programs proportionally. And if it's over a 5% change, then the committee will get back together and we'll, we'll make a decision on what to present to the, to, to the commissioners. Very good. Thank you, Anthony. Any questions for Anthony? Okay, we thank you very much, and we move now to item 4.6 uh, from also from Department of Human Services, Transportation 5310, Elderly and Handicapped Grant, and we're happy to have Bob Bushy from our Transportation Department to talk about that. Uh, good afternoon. Let me first apologize. My uh, laptop does not have a camera, um, but this is a... 5310 federal grant passed through by the city of Concord. Uh, the, they just released it in the amount of 377,128. There are going to be many applications for this. So we probably will not receive that full amount, but I have no idea what they will allow us. So I applied for the whole amount. Um, this provides transportation for seniors and handicapped in the urban area of the county. 50% uh, match of 188,564, which we would make up with $144,012 from the HCCDB grant, $87,395 from our road grant, and then $42,843 from the county. Uh, we are requesting that uh, you vote to accept this grant and hold a public hearing at the meeting. Okay, any questions for Mr. Bushy? Okay, and we will, we do have included on our agenda uh, that we'll be considering later on to for a public hearing uh, at 6.30 on June the 15th regarding this. Uh, any other questions? Okay, we move now to item 4.7 from finance, health insurance fund balance amendment. We're happy to have Susan Fearington with us to talk about that. Good evening. Um, the Health Insurance Fund, we usually look at it once a year. Well, actually more than once a year. We come to you once a year for um, updates. This year we've had um, high claims again, and we're asking to um, appropriate fund balance. Just to give you an idea, this year for um, FY20, our claims through April is $8.9 million dollars. And before for the whole year of FY19, it was 9.2. So we're not going to, we're going to definitely go over last year's um, claims. So uh, we looked at our, um, tried to estimate what we're going to think May and June is going to come in at. And we're thinking there's going to come in like $1.8 million between the two months, just based on the past history. We'll have a better idea come June 15th and can update the budget amendment at that time before your a meeting to make sure that we have our um, May numbers in, that we have a good estimate. And that way we're only estimating one month out. But for right now, until we're able to get those May numbers, which will probably be around June 10th, this is the best we can do. So in your agenda package, uh, there is a budget amendment that appropriates fund balance so we can 
um, make sure we meet our budget for that entire fund of $1.6 million. And that includes 1.605 of for claims to get our budget up to what it needs to be. And then we have two smaller changes for administration fees and HSA origination fees to get for the whole budget amendment. Um, just to um, give you an idea during the past, this would be our largest year, of course, um, each year we have, but we have more employees and we have more, um, you know, things going on right now. But just to uh, our estimate for the year is going to be $10.4 million for the claims for this year. So that will be our largest year so far. Are there any questions? Okay, any questions for Susan? Susan, are those fees normal and customary fees when we do something? Because I don't think we've had to do this any times that I can remember where we've had to take from the general fund. So are those fees pretty much normal if we have to do that? Okay, we're not, we're not actually taking it from the general fund. This um, is a, a fund all by itself and it has fund balance. Like a, for example, at um, June 30th of 19, we had $4.2 million in our fund balance. So we do keep that set aside for, you know, unusually high year of claims. So, mm -hmm. um, so we don't, we're not taking it from the general fund. This is money that's set aside in, in within that particular fund to cover shortfalls. So we do look work with our third party administrator to make sure that we're funding it appropriately each year that the fund so that we don't run into a problem where we have to appropriate fund amounts from the general fund to cover our um, large claim year. So we do, are constantly working with our third party administrator during the year. That's good. I just seen, you know, in the summer. there where it just said that the this that the amendment would appropriate fund fund balance and so that's why I thought it was coming from the general fund right it was fund balance within the fund itself okay I'm with you okay okay any other questions for Susan all righty and I think you have the next three items on the agenda so we'll move now to item 4.8 uh, juvenile crime prevention council Fiscal year 21 allocation of funds. Okay, so um, each year I bring for you um, our JCPC funding for um, the next fiscal year. So with the funding plan is included in your agenda packet. I'm happy to announce that we are um, going to have three new um, sub recipients this year. So we're always excited to get more programs in Cabarrus County and to be able to um, spread mm -hmm. some of the funding around and see what other programs can benefit for our youth in the county. So the three that we'll be adding are um, transforming youth men movement and they're going to do a program called Get Hired, um, Youth Employment, Employability as they call it, Aspire Youth and Family and, they're, and they have a program called Kids at Work. And then the third new one is um, Youth Development Initiatives and it's an after school academy for um, kids to uh, benefit from that. We did get more funding this year because of the raise the age so the state was able to allocate more funding which was which is wonderful so um, that is going to be put to good use we had lots of um, requests for the money from all the different sub recipients ones that we've used in the past and new ones but the committee worked hard uh, to, during two different meetings to allocate these funds and this is what we came up with and so it's part of our process for the commissioners to approve the funding plan and then if there's any changes during the year I have been given um, you have given me permission to work on your behalf and then come back and report to you after the fact but this particular funding since we have it ready I'd like to go ahead and present it to you so you can see it um, what the committee did come up with and said after the June 15th a meeting if it's approved then the, uh, the chairman can sign the funding papers and we can send it to the state and it will not um, slow down the sub recipients receiving their funding come July. Is there any questions? Any questions for Susan? Um, I will say that I serve on this Juvenile Crime Prevention Council, uh, and that is, um, I'm, I want to compliment uh, the citizens that serve on that uh, committee. Uh, they go through a very exhaustive process of looking at these funds and looking at the applicants 
the, the programs that are proposed. Um, they also spend a great deal of time throughout the year uh, evaluating those programs and, and, and monitoring them to make sure that those funds are spent appropriately and that those um, uh, juveniles that need those services are actually receiving them. Uh, so that they are an extremely dedicated uh, group of volunteers that really do a good job uh, for the youth in, in Cabarrus County. Uh, and Susan certainly is one of those council members that, that does an excellent job of look, look, looking out for those funds. These are not Cabarrus County funds. These are funds that originate from the state and flow down to Cabarrus County uh, for this purpose. Uh, and then, it, then we are charged with approving those allocations that that, that council uh, recommends. Did I get that right, Susan? That's right. That's right. Yeah. It's from the state. Great. So any, any other questions on that? Uh, if not, we'll move now to item 4.9. Uh, update of approved banking institutions and investment officers and Susan again. Okay, so we're looking to add to our list of authorized financial institutions. UBS company is a multinational bank and investment company with 150 years of experience. The firm is re uh, renowned uh, as a leader in wealth and management around the world. The company has provided the necessary documents as required by our investment policy which includes their first quarter financial statements, the FINRA a broker check and credit ratings. Um, so an updated banking institution list is provided in your agenda packet, which includes the proposed addition of the UBS and an updated authorized investment officers is also attached for your approval. So just wanted to keep that in, um, in your forefront. We don't have a tremendous amount of, of investment um, banking banking uh, institutions on our list because it would take a full-time person dedicated to uh, investments to be able to speak with all these different representatives. So we feel like we have a good um, cross-section of uh, different institutions to get us some good rates when we, we have money to invest. Of course, right now, as you know, interest rates are not too good, but when we do get up and going again with our investments and uh, going out longer term and looking at um, earning some more interest when things the economy turns around, then we'll be in a good shape to have another um, opportunity with UBS added to our investment list. So questions on that? Okay, if there are no questions on that one, we will move now to item 4.10. Uh, Susan again, update okay. of capital project fund budgets. Okay, so this is, um, we traditionally come to you this time of the year, our multi-year uh, budgets do have to have project ordinance updates made to them and what we're doing is we're going through and we're making sure that we have captured all the interest income sometimes we'll get interest income over and above our budget so we do want to allocate that interest which increases the interest income it increases the total amount that we can spend in the different funds so tonight we have eight different project ordinances that we'd like to um, present for updates and they are um, the construction and renovation fund the school construction fund the LOBS, which is limited obligation bonds, 2017 fund, the LOBS 2018 fund, the capital reserve fund, the small projects fund, the sheriff's fund, and the aging fund. So that's um, eight different ones to be updated. I did receive information today, um, considered our small projects fund, that I will need to increase that budget amendment again. We have some, um, I don't know if you remember, we have some Duke Energy rebates that we receive and we were able to um, get the money in from Duke and then reinvest it into housing projects um, and fix up homes. And right now, we're all the time, every year at the end of the year, we're having to reappropriate that money and then reappropriate it again. So just feel like it would be better suited in a multi-year fund so we don't have to constantly come to you and redo the Duke Energy. So I'd like to move that over on the recommendation of Kelly Sifford from planning. So I would like to update that particular project ordinance and budget amendment prior to the June 15th. Um, agenda is about $55,000 that would increase the net um, small projects fund. So just didn't want to point that out. Okay, questions for Susan on this item. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. We move now to item 4.11 from planning and development. 
uh, Community Development Blue Cross and Blue Shield Healthy Homes Initiative Grant Program. And we are happy to have Kelly Sifford with us to talk about that. Thank you. Uh, we have a very exciting opportunity here. As you recall, we had a Duke program that was funding uh, a number of things. Uh, now Blue Cross and Blue Shield, uh, they had a pilot going on for a while. They have now expanded the opportunity into Cabarrus County. Um, it gives kind of a list of things that we can do. A lot of it is um, mobility related, but they also have stuff for ventilation, uh, pest control, carbon monoxide and smoke detectors, things like that, duct cleaning. Um, so it's a companion program again to the weatherization program, allows us to uh, better serve our clients, be able to get uh, just and serve them more holistically. Uh, there is no match with this. This is just uh, $22,082 um, with a $2,500 uh, per serve or per client service. Um, and it has a 7% uh, admin available for us, so we could probably serve 10 to 12 households with this. Um, so I think it's a great opportunity for us. Um, so if there are any questions, I'll be glad to answer those. Okay, questions for Kelly. Very good, sounds like an excellent program. <clears throat> we'll now move to item 4.12, uh, also from Kelly. Uh, community development grant required plans and programs. So every three years with the CDBG and home programs that we participate in, uh, there are a number of federally required plans and programs that go with those. Um, they cover issues such as fair housing, anti-displacement, citizen participation, um, equal opportunities, things like that. Um, so I have all of those included. Um, they are the same uh, as they were the last time. There's no, been no changes in the wording to them. It's just uh, this will be for 20 uh, through 23. Um, and again, it's just guidance um, under those programs. Things that we have to do as part of those programs. Very good. Any questions for Kelly? All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, next item is 4.13 uh, from the Register of Deeds Office, a refund of excise tax. Um, I have down Wayne Nixon to present that, but I don't see him on the uh, list. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, he's asked, Wayne has asked me to handle that for him, if he would. Thank you, sir. Um, this is, uh, we get these from time to time. You may remember some of the others we've had. But what happens is if someone who records a deed puts the wrong stamps on uh, the wrong excise tax on the deed when they report it, and it turns out that usually it's just a mistake in the attorney's auction office. So they send in an affidavit and some information to show to the registered deeds that it was the wrong amount that was put on it. This is one of those cases. Wayne has looked at it. And he told me that he's approved, or not approved, but he's he's looked at it and determined that it's just a, a simple mistake. And I had looked at it myself separately when the documents were sent to me, and it looked to me like the same thing. But under the statutes, you all have to approve any refund. So that's why it comes to you before uh, on this agenda. Very good. Thank you, sir. Are, are there any, any questions of the County attorney regarding this. All right. In that case, then we will move to uh, number five, and this is the approval of the regular meeting agenda. Uh, of course, you all have a copy of that before you. I do not think that we have uh, made any changes. Um, I, and wait a I think there's one change. Yeah, we, won. we we voted on one of the issues. F11, uh, come. You you are correct. So that would be deleting on F11. F okay. Any other changes that anyone sees? That we do have. We will be um, setting three public hearings: uh, one for the budget, one for economic development allocation, and one for the transportation 5310 grant. 
I will move for approval with that one change. I'll second. Okay, we have a motion by Commissioner Honeycutt, a second by Commissioner Hsu uh, to approve the regular meeting agenda with the deletion of item F11. Um, is there any discussion? Okay, hearing none, all in favor, please say aye. Uh -huh. All opposed, no. Uh, that motion passes. Uh, we do have need of a closed session uh, tonight uh, to discuss pending litigation and personnel matters. Uh, so at this time, I would entertain a motion to go into closed session to discuss pending litigation and personnel matters authorized by North Carolina General Statute 143-318.11A2. B, A, three, and six. Seven. Yep. Okay, we have a motion by Commissioner Kiger, and I did not catch who seconded that. I'll second it, Mr. Chairman. Okay, second by Commissioner Hsu. Okay, is there any discussion? Uh, all in favor, please say aye. Aye. Uh -huh. All opposed, no. Uh, so we are now in closed session. Uh, before we sign off with the public, uh, we will remind you of our, our budget workshops. Uh, the first one being at 4 o'clock tomorrow uh, and the next one being at 4 o'clock on Thursday. Uh, so we will need to close out of this um, uh, meeting. And I think you all would have received a separate invitation for um, a closed session meeting to readjourn. Thank you all for joining us tonight. Uh, yes, sir. Did somebody yes, have a question? Mr. Chairman, I don't think I got the second email for uh, the closed session he, from Todd. It'll be on your calendar, Blake. If on your well, he without going into too much detail, it's I yeah. can't. Yeah. It's, it's not anyway. I don't have the second email. We so we will Todd, make sure that you. We will make sure that you receive that or you will receive a, a personal phone call from Mr. Shanley uh, very shortly. Yes, thank you. <laughs> All righty. Thank you. All right. So we, 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 we're now in closed session. Thank you.